Okay. Hi, Kevin with Springfield Leather. I wanted to take a couple minutes and convey something to you as a, a vegetable tanned leather buyer. Something that is it, pretty smart and it's pretty good for you to know. You know, with most things in life, you've heard the saying, you get what you pay for. Well, that's true to a large degree, but there's some instances where that's not true. And one of them can be in the leather world. If you've ever tooled on a piece of veg tan leather, more than one kind, then you know what the differences are. But some, we, we've noticed that we have a lot of customers that will buy a very expensive piece of leather and they feel that because they're spending more money it should be better for what they're doing. It's just simply not always true. A good example would be a double shoulder. Double shoulders are basically a they're kind of an, an off fall of the leather shoe sole industry. They use the bulk of that hide to make shoe soles and then they've got this double shoulder left over which happens to work really well for belts because of the shape. On the other hand, you have sides of leather. They're not as, as yield effective for belts, but the leather can be really nice. So getting back to what I told you, you can buy a number one import double shoulder, very rectangular, square, pretty nice and pretty clean, and it can run you at the moment $6.99 a square foot. You can also buy a piece of Herman Oak leather in a side for $5.79 a foot at the moment. And that's as of the date of this video. Which one's better? The one you pay seven bucks a foot for or the one you pay five seventy nine for? The answer is it's the one you pay five seventy nine for. It tools better, it cuts better, it molds better, and it dyes better. Holster makers, for example, all over the world would prefer to use Herman Oak or perhaps another tanneries leather. But through inexperience, some folks assume that just because this piece of leather costs seven dollars a foot, it's better than this one that costs five seventy-nine. Just not true. If you have questions, it's a pretty good thing to call and talk to us. We'll help you out. Thanks. Hi there. It's Rusty with Springfield Leather. We thought we might take a minute and do some uh, instructional videos like what we've been doing, kind of follow up. Something that we get a lot of questions on is adhesives. And when we first started talking about it, we thought, well, we would just do one on contact cement, which is one could really be done basically, specifically on contact cement. But, you know, it made me think that we carry a lot of different glues and adhesives, so maybe we ought to take a chance and just kind of go through a few of them, give you a few of the basics, and then I'll show you what they look like when they come out and kind of a few different ways how to utilize them. Some of your basic ones, Phoebings, Leathercraft Cement, it's good adhesive. Uh, it's a water-based adhesive. It, it's stronger and better than something like an Elmer's glue, but that's basically what you're looking at. It looks like that when it comes out. I'll show you a little bit about that. Neo Weld, it's a glue that works on contact. Um, kind of a funny glue, though, because when the cows come home, it still won't be dry. It'll never dry. It'll be sticky forever. Evertac is a water-based contact cement works well a lot of people have their preference it doesn't have a real harsh smell sometimes people like that a little bit better than they do some of your chemical based contact cements speaking of which this is a master's contact cement and this is a barge brand contact cement people ask us a lot of times which one's better well in reality they're about one and the same what your preference is is the one that you should use really uh, barge is a little bit more expensive than the masters Masters is, is just as good as the barge. They do a good job. Now when you get into chemical based contact cements, they usually will have their own thinners. And a thinner uh, will really make your glue go a little further, makes the use of it a little bit nicer, and helps it last a little longer. Now you might have found out somehow or another that you could use one thinner on 
on a couple of different glues. But if you're going to ask me, I'm going to recommend that you keep your barge thinner with your barge cement and your master's thinner with your master's cement. Uh, things like lacquer thinner and stuff like that, sure, they'll clean the glue up and they'll clean it off of things, but they're going to, it almost like it curdles it. Uh, if you've used the wrong thinner with the cement before, you know it just kind of turns it into curdled milk. Uh, so I'd recommend that you keep your brand specifics together, and then that way you don't have any issues because glue isn't cheap. Okay, let's start with the contact cement since that's what we're talking about. I kind of like one of these containers. Um, what I usually will do is, is I like to work with my glue a little bit thinner, and so I'll about two-thirds with cement, and then I'll top the rest of it up with thinner and just shake the snot out of it downside to plastic is is that the chemical base begins to evaporate over time after not being used it seeps through the sidewalls so the glue can dry out in it after a while so you may have to add a little thinner if you get your cement and you go to open it and it's a little thin or a little thick add a little bit of thinner to it shake it up now it will get to a point where it becomes rubbery and it's pretty much gone it's toast good thing about this is it has a brush on it. Now, a lot of these cans will have a brush made to it too, but what you'll notice when you open it and you use a full can, you've got cement all the way to the top of that brush. It's okay if you're ready for it and you're prepared, but being able to use one of these plastic containers allows you to adjust the brush into the cement deeper. You can make that adjustment, just slide it down as you use your cement. You just push your brush down and you can use it just right off the tip and then you don't have to worry about all that glue up there. I'll give you a tip too, e either on the can or on these, if you put a little bit of Vaseline around the top of that thing, it won't stick. You'll be able to open it up every time. So, my preference, you do what you want. Whenever you use a contact cement straight out of the can, especially after you've had the can for a little bit, like I said, it'll become thick. And when you put thick contact cement on, what you basically end up with is you end up with a glob in the middle and then you get it thinner as it goes out. Still has the same effect a lot of times, but it's rubbery, it's thick, it's mushy, it seeps through the material sometimes uh, in that specific spot where it's thick. Just not real happy to work with. So again, if you'll thin it down a little bit, you'll be able to see how it kind of spreads out for us a little bit nicer. And if you'll go from the center out, a lot of times you'll keep from getting much glue on the outside edge of your pieces. Now I'm not being very careful for the fact that I'm just not, I'm not really making anything. I'm just wanting to show you this for the sake of seeing it. Put a piece of paper underneath of it, you can just run right off the edge. The only thing you got to be careful of is, is that eventually you're going to work back over that spot. Once I put my glue on there, my contact cement, contact cement works on contact. Now, a lot of times people will take and put their adhesive on this piece, and they'll put their adhesive on the other piece, and then they'll just stick them together, and they'll press them down. Well, that's true. It is on contact, but the idea behind contact cement is for it to be dry or have the appearance that it's dry. You notice how stringy it is when it's wet? If you'll let this set 20 minutes, let it absorb into it, then put your two pieces together. That's really the contact that they're talking about. That's what you're trying to accomplish. Now, the interesting thing about contact cement is, is that it evaporates eventually and leaves the glue behind, but it absorbs into the material. Now, leather is such a porous material that it absorbs in quite a ways. So what you really want to do is, is you want to put enough glue on it for it to absorb into it and adhere to the fibers. Once it's dry, I like to put a second thin coat on, and now I'm adhering to the glue that's adhered to the fibers. Because what'll happen is when I let this dry, it's gonna look very rough and very dry. You really won't be able to tell this wet look that it had, it will kind of be gone. So when I apply a second coat over it, I'm really getting a good adhesion. Now, if you're just sticking them together and you're gonna sew them up, sure, one coat works. But if you really want a good bond so that out on the edge of something, like I say a wallet, you're putting it together, you want to have that edge so that it's nice and tight, doesn't show where the leather's beginning to separate, throw a second coat of glue on, even if you just do it around the perimeter and let it dry as well. Now, I'm not a very patient person, as you may know. So what I like to do is I like to cheat. I like to take hair dryer, speed this process up. The first coat, if you're going to do two coat process, the first coat can be absolutely dry, it can be days old. 
does not matter how old it is, as long as it's clean. So I'm gonna dry this real quick and then we'll apply a second coat. That's really pretty good. Contact cement's a funny thing because it just, you know, if you take and put it together wet and press it, it will adhere eventually, but it just never seems like you get the same adhesion as you will when you do it correctly. And along with not being a patient person, I'm kind of a tightwad, and so I've even tried to go to Lowe's or uh, Home Depot or someplace like that and buy uh, a brand of, of uh, contact cement designed really for wood. And I'll tell you, it works, but it doesn't work. And that's, it, it's kind of funny because it has more of an oil base to it. And so you get an adhesion, but you don't get a lasting adhesion no matter what you do. So for the sake of showing you what we've got going here, you don't really see much of a difference, but I promise you that you will get a tremendous difference. Now this really should be about dry enough that it doesn't stick. Now if you've got glue on your fingers like I do, it's going to stick to that. But for the most part, it should be dry enough that it doesn't really pick up when you tap on it. You don't want it as wet as that. And like I said, on your first coat, it can be just absolutely dry. After about a 20 minute period on your second coat, third 30 minute period, it's going to dry so much that you're not going to get a good adhesion. So you want to make sure on your on your coat that you're going to stick together, no matter if you're doing a two coat or a one coat, you want to make sure that you really don't let that set too long. But yet you don't want it too wet either. Now whenever you set those, you better be prepared because when it sets, it's going to set and it is going to stick. And I'll tell you another trick that I like to do is, is to take a hammer and you can do it on a marble slab or something. You want to set those fibers and you want to set that glue nice and tight together and you will not pull that thing apart. I've seen a lot of times we sit and play around with it and once it's set, now it's still fairly moist right at the moment, but in an hour or so when that's completely set and done, you'll tear the fibers of the leather before you, before you tear the glue a lot of times. You can re release it to some degree with a little bit of heat, but for the most part, once it's there, it is there. Okay, you know your barge works the same way, your masters works that way, there's some other brands called Van Grip, they work well, same process. Most of your contact cements are all going to work the same way. They're going to work, quote unquote, on contact. Now, something that they're not going to do, though, is, is you're not going to stick a contact cement. You're not going to apply something with a contact cement to the outside of it very happily. Um, the other thing is, is, if you get a little bit of contact cement on the outside of your leather, even if it's vegetable tan leather, if it's an oil tan leather, if it's a finished leather like this upholstery hide, doesn't matter what it is. If you get a little contact cement on there, you can take an all-purpose eraser and it'll just roll that contact cement right up off of it. You'll really find it handy when you're dyeing something and man, you've gotten all this work in it and you're putting a good dye coat on and all of a sudden you find a nice natural colored spot right in the middle of your holster. You take that eraser and it'll just roll that right off of there and it'll take dye just like it normally would. Now, what I said though was is that you're not going to apply dye, or I'm sorry, uh, glue to something like this and adhere it to the outside and expect it to stay there. And the reason is is because it's not able to absorb into the fibers, it's not able to really get a good bond. You've got too slick of a face on it, you've got too slick of an edge on it, it's not going to stick well. That's where something like this Neo Weld comes in handy, and I really like it. You can use these leather cements, but again, you end up, they don't really have any fibers to bond to. Now, I'm going to jump around a little bit, but this Neo Weld's kind of fun. Uh, some people like it, some people hate it. It, like any glue, has a tendency to possibly clog up a needle in a sewing machine. Your contact cements have the worst tendency to do that, more so than your leather craft cements. Um, or a just a, a, a cement or an adhesive like that. This, since it never dries, will most certainly clog up a needle in a sewing machine. But it's worth it to me when I'm wanting to do what I'm about to show you. Comes out white, smells horrific. Well, not really, but it doesn't smell all that great. 
goes on white, but when it dries, it dries clear. And all I'm using here is just a little clipping of a piece of leather. You can use a, a cheap art brush, you can use anything. The fact that it dries clear is pretty nice because I don't get real careful about how I put it on. Um, I just want to get it on there and have it dry and set so that I can do what I need to do with it. If you ever do any kind of binding, like you're going to put a bound edge on, on a uh, portfolio or a purse or a bag or a wallet or something, this works really well because on an annual weld you only have to apply it to one surface. It does not need to be applied to both surfaces like a contact cement would. So you can put it on the one piece that you're going to do your binding with, let it dry, and you're ready to stick. So let's speed this process up just a little bit. Sticky. Very, very sticky. Whenever it's thick like that, it doesn't like to dry very, uh, very quick. But you can take that dude and stick it right to the middle of a slick, finished piece of leather and sew it down. Now you're not going to find a cement that's going to adhere that permanently and never have to do anything else to it. But if you're going to sew it down, that is fantastic. It is on there. You can peel the edges of it up, don't get me wrong, but it is on there well enough to sew it without a doubt. I've seen they'll take a couple of rivets and put a rivet in the end of each one and one in the center. Stays down pretty nice. Now, the good thing about it is, is if I decided that I didn't like it, I could move it, peel it off, put it somewhere else. But you need to know something. Depending on the leather that you're using, you may have just taken the finish right off of that piece of leather. Handy, but be careful. It's still sticky enough to just plug it right back on something else. It is the same way as being able to roll it off. You just kind of roll it off your fingers and peel it off of there. But be careful about what you stick it to because it may, if you've got to peel it back off, it may take the finish off with it. Okay. Well, anyway, that's kind of a handy one that I like. Like I said, if you're doing a bound edge or something, you put it on there, you can just stretch that edge around, stitch it down, and trim it off, and you've got a nice clean edge, well bonded, well stuck down. Your Leathercraft cement and your Evertac. Again, your Evertac is a contact cement. I usually use it a lot like I would this, something that you're going to put a little bit of glue on, put together, press, and leave alone. Um, for the sake of being able to do a project, get things done, move right along, I really like using the contact cements and the Neo welds. Um, this one has its place though, you know, if you've got, say you've got a book or a Bible or something that you've opened to a spot so many times and it kind of splits, take a little of that and put it right in it, close it, press it, leave it overnight and it'll, it'll hold it together quite well. I think we've covered just about everything that we're going to be able to cover, so until the next time. Hi, it's Rusty with Springfield Leather again. You know, the point behind doing these videos is not to cover every single thing and everybody finds out that there's a million ways to skin that poor cat. But the idea is to kind of give some hints and some tips and to help people to get started so that they're more successful with the project or projects that they're trying to accomplish. So when we do these, we cover a few things, but know that there's always more ways to do everything. So real quick, what I thought we would do on this video was is to kind of cover finishing an edge. And primarily this is going to work with vegetable tan leathers, things that you've made, holsters and sheaths and things of that nature out of. But the principles will apply a lot of times to chrome tan leathers too. Maybe you've made a journal, maybe you've made a, a bag or something and you've got some edges on it. We're going to cover a couple of quick things, give you some ideas, maybe it'll help something that you're getting ready to do turn out just a little bit better. So what I've got is I've got a piece of vegetable tan leather and as you can see it's nothing special I've got a number three edger and when you when you make something and you've got that square edge it's nice to have a slick rounded off edge and that's what these edgers are good for and if you watch you it's all in the wrist really you have gotta get the right angle and once you start on that you can run that edger down the side and it'll really give you a nice finished edge and obviously it works better on the front than it does on the back. But the principle is there. 
usually what a person might do when they first get this is they'll take some jeweler's rouge and put it on the back of a, of a piece of veg tan leather like this and strop it a few times like you would a, a swivel knife and it helps to polish that and it helps to kind of sharpen it up just a little bit so that you get a good clean cut. Now I'm not sure how well you can see that but it's rounded those edges off just a little bit so it's starting to get a nice edge. Now if you have taken this and you've put it together and you've glued it and you're getting ready to sew it, a sander works great to just take and sand along those edges and get them flat, nice and even and then you can bevel those edges and it allows you to have a nice tight clean look so that you got a, 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 a attractive edge you might say. Now once you've gotten to that point you can leave it like that but there's a few different things that you could do to make it just a little bit better. And I, it, Instead of dragging out a bunch of water I grabbed a napkin with a little bit of water in it. Primarily on vegetable tan leather you put a little bit of water on that and let it set. This is a piece of canvas cloth you can use denim, you can use a burnishing wheel of some sort, but if they don't have any of that, all you need really is a piece of canvas and some elbow grease. And just draw it the same direction five or six times. And the harder you draw it, the more times you draw it, the slicker that edge will get and the more the burnishing will work on that edge and the nicer edge you'll have. Now, with that being said, that would be a minimum. That would be about the, the least that you're going to do. Something that some people use too is an edge slicker. I've seen people mount these on a drill press. Just run them with that. Um, usually you can run it down that side. It does the same thing. It slicks that edge up. Again, this is kind of a minimum. Another one that they're making, and, and people make these themselves a lot of times, is just a, a piece of hardwood with some grooves in it. And those grooves allow you to do the exact same thing. Now when you use water like that, you've burnished the edge, but it's really not probably going to stay that way. So what you can do is you can do this, dye it, put some finish on it, put some wax on it, and, and redo it and buff it out. Let's say you use a, a finish like a, a, an acrylic finish, maybe leather balm with atom wax or something to that effect. That's going to give you a, an edge that's pretty decent, but again, you, you've stepped up about halfway. You really could do more. And one of those ways that you could do more is a product called gum trag, for the sake of not being able to always pronounce the gum tragacanth. Anyway, it's, a, it's kind of a funny product. You put that on the edge, let it sit there for a few minutes, and then slick it down, and it is going to stay. The beauty of it is, is that it also works really nice. I'm not sure if you can see that on the back of there. You've kind of got those fuzzies. If you'll take that gum trag, and you can apply it just about any way you want. take and put it on with a sponge even. Rub it in there and let it set for just a couple minutes. It kind of smells like pine salt to me for whatever reason. You got to know that we do these through, day, through the day during business hours so we get all kinds of stuff in the background. This is called a glass slicker. I'm not sure how well you can see it but it basically is just about a quarter inch piece of glass that has a nice beveled edge all the way around it. And you can use a hard block, you can use a hard wood, um, something that's going to give you a real good solid hard surface. And some people are familiar with pasted back leather. That's basically what you're going to end up with and it will stay that way. Now, good and bad. One, once the gum drag is on there, it will it acts as a dye blocker. It will block the majority of dye that you're trying to put on. So, if you were going to dye the product, I would recommend that you dyed it first, then did this with your gum drag and then, you know, used it as a uh, as a blocker. Uh, some people will use it and and put some dye over it and it will accept a little bit, but don't expect it to accept much as far as dye goes. But again, if you take that and put that on the edge like that, that is going to give you 
in my opinion, just about the best edge that you're gonna get because that will mat that down and it'll stay down and it looks good that way. Now these principles work on chrome tanned leather to a degree. Uh, you have to know that chrome tanned leather is just a different animal entirely and so you know a little bit of experimenting is going to go a long ways in helping you to see what's going to give you the product that you want. And it's funny because you talk to people and they say, well, I've done it this way forever, but I was thinking about changing. Well, why were you thinking about changing? Well, I don't know. It's been working. Not always a, necessarily a reason to have to change. That's going to give you something nice. I thought I'd take a second, too, and help you to know that there are ways to end up with a really nice edge, too. If you've got a leather that's not struck all the way through, meaning the dye didn't penetrate all the way through, black on top, black on bottom, this natural color in the middle. This is called a Yankee wax is what we refer to it as. And basically what you do is, is you put it on a burnishing wheel. Maybe the wheel is made of a canvas piece. You put it on there and it is basically a crayon. And you burnish that into it. And what that does is, is that friction will melt that wax right down into the edge. Gives you a great looking edge in my opinion. Also helps to mat it down and I'll just do a little bit of it so that you can see it. Now you've got to realize though that me doing that by hand is giving you nothing in comparison to what it looks like when it's been ran on a buffing wheel. Um, unfortunately maybe you only have a Dremel, it will work. Uh, it's not always the easiest to get that edge nice the way you want it, but it'll really slick that edge down gives you a nice finished edge and I'll tell you how to cheat too. I've done some some edges put a strip of, of high embossed leather down the center of a piece of veg tan on a belt strap or a buckle strap if you'll take crayons and mix them together you can kinda get different colors we carry this in black, brown, natural and tan but if you get an oddball color you want to make you might try a crayon. You'd be surprised at how handy they come in, or how they come in handy and they'll kind of get you out of a pinch. Anyway, I'm certain that there's more things that we could have talked about. This is just a little something to help you out. Until next time. Hi, it's Rusty with Springfield Leather again. I thought we'd take a few minutes and kind of go over some thoughts on uh, conditioners. It's getting to be that time of year, especially here where they're calling for the possibility of a little bit of snow. Uh, so we thought we might take a minute, help you to understand the difference between conditioners, how to use them, how maybe you would not want to use them, what's okay and possibly what's not okay. I'm going to jump right in with oil. This the one I grabbed here is a Neats foot oil. Uh, it's a compound, but it is an oil. Now, you know, a lot of the old guys, the farmers or whatever, will use Neats foot oil on their boots or on their jacket, whatever the case may be. And that's fine, but you got to know what it's going to do. Oil is oil. Once it absorbs into a leather, it is going to be dark and it's going to be there and it's never going to come back. Now, the other thing about oils is, is you want to make sure that you know what's in it because once you put oils into leather, there's a little bit of a chance that it's going to come off on you. There's animal fats in oils, so if it's going to be something that gets stored, it could draw mice. <clears throat> They'll have a tendency to chew on it because of the fats that's in it. Um, you know, if it's, it's a pair of work boots, you want to oil them up, great. That oil is probably going to help you out quite a bit as far as water resistance, but know that once it's that color, it will always be that color. Uh, now, if you're using some, or you're putting it on something that you don't really want to go dark, uh, if you're using it on a jacket or if you're using it on a little bit more of an open pour leather, Bic 4, Bic More product, Lexol, great products, great conditioners. Now, there's no way in the world to go through Yo, all man, the different up? brands of leather conditioner and sit down here and tell you about them. So these are the ones that we carry, we recommend a lot, we use a lot. That's not to say one's better than the other, that's not to say that the one that you're using isn't as good as these. We're comfortable with these, we use these, and so they're the ones that we sell because we know how to utilize them and we know how they work and we know that they do work. <clears throat> with either one of these, once you put them on, they may darken the leather initially, but then that darkness is going to go away as they dry because basically the wet, the leather got wet. 
Um, it absorbs in, softens the fibers up, and then it evaporates, the moisture evaporates out. Different kinds of leathers, though, you want to be careful about because an open pore leather like this, this is almost what you would call a new buck. This is a little bit of an oil tan. A new buck leather, you really won't want to use a conditioner like this on a new buck leather because it may cause water spots just like it would if you were putting it on a suede. Uh, so they make another product for that. They love it when I take these off the shelf and do that. There's no wrong way to apply either one of these. Uh, there, you're not going to over condition a leather usually that you're using an actual conditioner. Now if you were using something that had a wax in it or uh, some sort of, of thing that could build up, that might be an issue. But as far as these go, just put it on your hand and put it on there. And you'll see it darkened it up pretty good. It's going to dry back. I would recommend that you made sure that you got it over the whole thing and then that way you've got a good coverage and once you rub it in and you begin to work that conditioner it warms that leather up and that warmth helps to draw that in it helps that conditioner to really go into the fibers and be able to be absorbed and utilized uh, now if you don't rub it in it, it's still going to go in but it's probably not going to go in as quickly it's probably not going to go in as deeply and it probably uh, could be done a little bit better, you might say. What's funny about these products, especially Bickmore's product, they actually started out in the industry in hoof care, in animal product care. And so they've got a lot of experience in making something that's going to be good for your skin. And that's the great part, is it's good for your hands, too. Um, something that's interesting about the BIC4 product, and I know it because it's the one I use primarily personally just because of, of I like the way that it works, is it has a little bit of vinegar in it. And it might sound interesting to you or odd to you, but a little bit of vinegar will help to set the dye in leathers. Vinegar also can deter mold. Now it's not necessarily going to get rid of mold, but it can help to deter it. If you had mold on it, you would want to make sure that you killed the mold spores and then went back and, and put a conditioner in it. Something else that people don't realize a lot of times is is that you know you can take this piece of leather and you can throw it in the dryer. Now why would you do that? Well what happens when you dry or when you warm it up it, it evaporates the moistures out of the leather but it also softens it up. Once the leather's warm then you condition it it'll really draw that conditioner in. It does a nice job makes it soft and supple. Uh, the other thing too is people are always concerned about getting their leather wet and with a suede or a new buck leather you need to be concerned. But you know it's really not the end of the world if you get your leather wet as long as you deal with it correctly. Um, if you'll take, get it dried as quickly as you can, put some conditioner back on it because what happens is, is when the water evaporates out of the leather it takes moisture with it so it tightens up the grains and it makes it stiff. Whenever you dye a vegetable tanned leather and you use an alcohol based dye, when that alcohol evaporates, it pulls moisture out, makes that leather stiff. So if you've made a holster and you've wet molded it, it's got a stiffness to it. Well, then when you put that alcohol on there, it evaporates, pulls more moisture out of it, and really tightens it up. And if you use electric heat, like a blow dryer or a dryer, it's pulling that moisture out, which is fine as long as you replace it. A lot of times you'll see old parts or saddle pieces or something and the, the leather is just dry and cracking and you can tear it. Unfortunately, once you get to that point with leather, about the only thing you can do is condition it to stop the deterioration from going any further. There, there comes a point with leather that once you've hit that point, it's done, you're not coming back. Uh, but you can slow it down, you can stop it. Uh, it's just not gonna, it's not gonna rejuvenate it at, after that point. Now. The good thing about them is, is they polish, they protect, and they do all those wonderful things that the label says, but what they're not going to do is they're not going to repel water, either one of them. So if you get your leather wet, you got it conditioned, you get it wet, it's going to help, it's going to keep it from getting stiff, it's going to keep some of that water from penetrating, but it's really not a water repellent. And that's an entirely different video. Uh, there's a number of different things that are made for that. But there's kind of a fine line 
when you're talking about leathers and conditioners and cleaners because there's also a cleaner that goes with this BIC-4 called a BIC-1. And it's a pretty aggressive cleaner. Uh, if you were really wanting to, to get some oils off and lift some oils out so that you could get a good clean start and condition it up and rejuvenate and refresh, then you would want to use that. Well, with suede, got to be careful because it really will take those water spots and you, if you've ever had a suede jacket or a pair of moccasins, you know what I'm talking about. It's not a happy deal. So you'd want to use a suede cleaner, a suede or a new buck cleaner, and then a lot of people will recommend taking a, uh, a, a brass wire brush or a soft wire brush and brushing the nap back up on it after you've used it, and that's perfectly fine. About the only style of repellent for a uh, suede jacket, suede shoes or something is similar to this. This is a Bickmore product also. It's called Guardmore and it is a good repellent for uh, suede and moccasins and things of that nature. And You can spray it on, follow the directions, it does a good job. Hi, I'm Kevin with Springfield Leather. I have had recently several people ask me how to use this happy little gadget. It's called a lace maker. A lace maker is a really cool tool. Howsomever, it can be a really frustrating tool if you don't know how to use it. So I thought we'd do this brief little tutorial. First of all, a lace maker will only work with a sharp blade. If for any reason you've gotten your blade dull, you might as well just forget it. It's done. You need to replace the blade. And that's not a big deal. It's easy enough. Just replace it and then you'll be good to go. Also, a lace maker is designed to work on relatively firm leather. Now, they can be thin leather, they just need to be firm, have some body. Now, when you get really good with this, you can cut soft, mushy leather. I can cut deerskin with it, but it is more difficult, and you really need to have some practice under your belt before you try that. So, first of all, I'm going to take a little piece of scrap leather that I happen to come by from the Justin Boot Company. I've cut myself a little, little piece of leather here and I'm going to take my shears and I'm going to cut a hole approximately in the center of it. Now, you can take a round drive punch. That's a lot easier. Just bonk. Make yourself a nice round little hole. And that works quite well. I've been cutting lace with a lace maker for so many years I can't even think about it. If you're right-handed, you hold the lace maker in your right hand and you keep the sharp point of the blade out in front of you, pointing away from you. you put it through the hole in your leather. And at this point, again, you want that blade facing straight away from you. The sharp point to be going away from you. Then you give it a push, you hold your leather firmly with your left hand, you give it a push and a twist, just a little one, watch. There, not much. Now, I can see a little tail just starting to appear, so I'm gonna give it another little bitty push and a twist, and there it is. Don't know if you can see that down in there, it's kinda of hard to see, but that little tail is there. So I'm going to work my fingers in there. You can see it's sticking up now, maybe. I'm going to grab a hold of that tail and just, just start to work it a little bit. When you're doing that, you need to keep this finger of your left hand up underneath this leather. If you didn't notice, when we started this lace maker, we started it like this, right-handed. Give it that little twist. Now once you've got that tail out there, you switch hands. Very important. Then you get a hold of that little tail and you start to work it through or you break it off, whatever the case, and you start to pull it around through there. It just takes a, a little bit of working with your fingers until it sticks out and then you can pull it, and the next thing you know, you're making lace. Now, if you pull too fast, it's not going to work at all. So 
just take it nice and slow and we're making some lace here that's probably oh looks to me like about an eighth of an inch wide and from that little four inch circle we've got I don't know maybe 10 12 feet of lace I'm gonna do this once again just so that you can see except this time I'm gonna make wider lace I want to take my thumbnail and I'm going to push this ring, this retaining ring, off the lace maker. I'm going to pull the blade out. I'm going to slide it over into the next slot. I'm going to tap it with my scissors here a little bit. Get the blade back in there. And I'm going to put this little retaining ring on there again sliding it down onto that plastic and working working my way around it'll go gradually which is a good thing until it's holding the blade in this time we're going to make wider lace I'll try another piece of leather this is another little boot scrap I'm kind of going to fold it over I'm going to cut my little circle right in the middle of it. Take my right hand. The blade is pointing away from me. I'm going to put it in that hole. I'm going to hang on to this with my left hand. I'm going to give it a little push and a twist. And there's that tail. I'm going to switch hands now, just like you saw me do. I'm using my left hand on the lace maker. Grab a hold of that little tail and start turning it around. And this time we're making wider lace. This would make great buck stitch lacing for a pillow, maybe a handbag, home decor item, something like that. Won't get quite as much lace out of the piece, but you get quite a bit. Makes really good lace. Now, if you want to cut thin leather, you can do that. First, you gotta have a hole in it. If your leather is firm, now this is about two ounce leather, maybe two and a half at the most. If it's firm, push it away, give it a twist. You might have to give it two twists until that little tail appears. Hold your finger up underneath that leather grab the tail and even if you have to grab this outer piece of leather at the same time that's fine do that until you can work it around now one thing you need to take note of if you've got a thin piece of leather and you're cutting on the the top slot means you've got quite a bit of space in there between the leather and the top of the lace maker if you're not careful the leather will bunch up in there and it's hard to cut lace that way. That's why you use this first finger to keep the leather pushed up against the top of the lace maker. You push it up there just enough to keep it firm and then you can pull it through. Now if you want you can cut a larger piece. Size really doesn't matter too much except when you get above a square foot. A lace maker really is not very happy if you cut a piece of leather that's over a square foot. And with pieces that are larger, there's a few little tricks. We're going to cut our hole and start it just like always. Give it a little push and a twist. We're going to switch. We're going to switch hands. Grab that little tail and the piece of leather all at the same time and we're going to start to push. Now sometimes your leather, because of drooping down, will not pull through so easily. So what you need to do is you might have to give it a little flop, give it a little flip, all the while using that, that finger of your left hand to hold the leather up against the inside top of the lace maker. And if it, here we go.
Another thing is that if, if you pull too fast, you'll burn your finger. And if you make too much lace too fast, you'll also start to melt a slot in that little lace maker. And that's not a good thing. To stop it, that's all there is to it. Now, for what it's worth, as I mentioned before, you can cut soft leather with this, but that little trick of the flapping really comes into play. So learn to cut some stiff leather first, uh, various kinds. Once you get that down, you'll understand and you'll do pretty good. Happy lace making. Hello. I have a happy little little wizard border tool in my hand. I just got asked how this worked, so I thought I'd show you. It works with a swivel knife. And one thing you have to know is it only works with this particular blade. That's the big wide one that comes standard with most swivel knives. All you do is take the little screw on the end and loosen it until you get to a point where this little swivel knife will stick down in there and this little collar on the the little gadget needs to have this little lump sticking out down to the bottom so stick your swivel knife right in there and then use your screwdriver to tighten it down don't tighten it very much this thing is plastic it can break easily okay then you have another little screw here We'll loosen that one eventually. And we're going to slide it in till I got about, oh, maybe 3 sixteenths of an inch. And we're going to tighten it down a little bit. Again, not overly tight. Make sure of that. Now I'm going to grab some water. And I'm going to take this happy little piece of Herman Oak leather and get it wet. And another thing too, your swivel knife has to be sharp. So strop it first before you put it in here. All you do is run it right along the edge using this little collar as a guide and poof, or voila, whatever you want to say, you have an instant border on your belt. Of course, this is a little shorter, but this is a fast way to run a nice even edge down both sides of a strap. And that's it. That's the whole deal. Thanks. Hi, Kevin with Springfield Leather. We wanted to do just a short little how-to tip video on how to use a really, really common leather working tool. You probably recognize it. It's called a bone folder. You know, there's a lot of people out there that don't even know that this tool comes apart. It's kind of handy to know if you don't know that. But a bone folder does several things. The big pointy end here, I'm really not going to tell you too much about because you probably know how to use that already. It's used to form leather. It's used to mold it uh, like you'd mold a holster or a knife sheet does a good job with that but this but the rest of it has some interesting functions and I'll show you first thing I'm going to do take an edger and cut the corner off of the this little piece of leather I get my highly technical super extra expensive dollar general sponge wet and I'm going to wet the edge of this leather. It's just a natural piece, hasn't been stamped or tooled or anything, but I got the edge pretty wet. A lot of crafters, especially hobbyists, they don't have the machinery it takes to professionally put an edge on a piece of leather, so they'll make their belt and they'll use one of those little circle things to edge it with, and that works fine, but you can also use a bone folder like this.
Now, is the leather, when you've got the right amount of water in the leather, and you rub that edge, and you put a lot of friction on it, you really get a pretty darn good burnish. That's one way. It's actually faster than that little circle, unless, of course, you've got the circle in your battery-powered drill. With some leathers that maybe aren't quite as thick as this piece of 8 to 9 or 9 to 10, we're going to take the edge off again. And again, get it wet. This time, uh, the end of this little tool has some grooves in it. And most people probably already know or can figure out that you can take the proper size groove and you can run that back and forth just like that little circle edge slicker that some people use. And that puts a really nice burnish on your leather. Makes it look really good. But the thing that a lot of people aren't aware of about a bone folder is some of the other things that it'll do. So I'm going to get this little piece of leather wet. And maybe we'll get this one wet too. And I'll show you. Those little grooves are graduated steps. Here's one thing that you can do with them. It's pretty hard to make a border that's that nice, but that bone folder will just do it slick as all get out in just a minute. If you want a wider border, now we've actually got a, a wider border that looks like a double a double bladed swivel knife. Now that's pretty cool. We can take another one and this one will actually give you a really nice wider border. Now, for what it's worth, you can also substitute this for a stitching groover. If you need to make a, a groove to lay some stitches in, you can use any one of these little edges that you want and just make that little groove, poke your holes, and you're good to go. That's some handy things to know about a bone folder. Happy days. Hope you're smarter. Hi, Rusty and Kevin with Springfield Leather. I thought we'd do a little tutorial about a, how to use a strap cutter. You know, a strap cutter is probably one of the most basic leather craft tools that there is. And it's a wonderful tool to use, but there's a lot of people that have a few little issues with it. They just, you know, they call us on the phone and, you know, they tell us, well, my strap cutter just doesn't work so well. So I thought what we'd do is clear up some things, show you how it would be used in a basic manner, and I'll show you a couple of advanced things that are just nice to know. Maybe you weren't aware of all that this tool can do. First of all, here's our happy little strap cutter. There's two kinds. There's one that's made in this country by Leatherworks Products, and it's a really good one. There's one that's made overseas, and it works. Eh, you know, it's not the same. Just letting you know up front. This one, has all the simple little adjustments, but there's something that's nice to know. Now mine doesn't have a <coughs> mine doesn't have a blade in it right now. Here's what I want you to look at. With the strap cutter, you've got the obvious uh, crossbars, but on this side of the handle, there's a small dished out area. It's really easy to overlook that dished out area when you put this together, so you can put it together upside down. A lot of people aren't aware that this can be upside down, but it can. The blade 
side of the crossbars have to be where that little dished out area is. That little dished out area is what helps you to keep the leather right up against the flat side of the strap cutter when you pull it. Uh, now, the key to this is a sharp blade. Strap cutters don't work with a dull blade, period. The blade that you get with it, or two blades that you get with it, are short. You can loosen these two little end screws. The blade will, will go right in these little slots here. And it's, it's pretty self-explanatory, pretty easy to put blades in. I'll tell you, the thing that I've had, though, is, is sometimes people don't understand that the blade, when it goes in there, the sharp edge goes to where the wood isn't cut all the way through. And that way, when you put strain on it, the dull edge of the blade comes against those screws. And that's what holds them in there and allows you to be able to pull it through there. And you want to run. And I, I thought it was an obvious thing, and, and it was funny because it was Jill. <laughs> The, the leather goes through the center of it. Sometimes people want to cut it on top. Yeah. Not not happy. That's a that's a little trick that you can use. For our purposes here, we're going to use a different blade. I've got a little, for those of you that are old enough to remember a Schick injector razor, this is a Schick injector blade. I've loosened the screws to where I can slide this blade right down between the two crossbars. Now, a little bit sticks up. A little bit sticks out from the bottom. This is dangerous. Mainly to me. I can walk past this on the table and get cut, I promise. I have been using a strap cutter ever since I was knee high to Bubby the Wonder Dog. And this is the blade I want to use because when it gets dull, here's what I do. I pull the blade up a sixteenth of an inch and I've got a new cutting surface or an eighth of an inch and I pull it up again and I can cut some more. Or I push it down and I can cut. Another advantage to that blade is, is it's not quite as thick width-wise or thickness-wise, so it slips through there a little bit easier, it seems like, too. Yep. You have a happy little uh, ruler here on this side of the crossbars so that you can, you can gauge your, the width of your strap. For what it's worth, if you're cutting firm leather, you can pretty much believe that, that ruler. You set it at an inch and a half, you'll get an inch. You set it at a half an inch, you'll get a half an inch. If you're cutting soft leather, your, le your strip will almost always come out wider than your measurement. Now, for what it's worth, you, you need to know, this tool will cut veg leather, it will cut suede, it will cut very soft leather. The key, there's, there's several key points. Number one, you have to have a sharp blade. Now, veg leather is easy, so we'll do that first. I'm going to loosen the little screw that allows you to slide these crossbars. I'm going to slide it in here about a half an inch. Now, you've probably noticed that your crossbars have a little thumb screw on the back. Again, this is something that's important that many people don't realize. The spacing right here, the space between these crossbars needs to be the same here and here. Actually, the tool works better if the space is wider at the back side where there is no blade, the tool just works better that way. I can't tell you why, I just know that it does. Another thought too is, is whenever you set this up and get ready to cut, you want to make sure that that space isn't way over the thickness of your leather. You want it a little bit thicker or wider of an opening, but not a bunch, especially on a softer leather because yeah, it'll wad that thing up. That's absolutely critical. Any leather that you cut, you want these, these crossbars to be open just enough to, for that leather to pass through. Now, on veg leather, it's not so critical because it's firm. But we've got this set at about, oh, just under a half an inch. Now, you should have a straight edge. This is a relative straight edge, but I want to show you something. I'm going to put this leather, I'm going to start it with the leather back here where my thumb is, right up against that handle. And I'm going to pull it, and I'm just going to pull it nice and straight. But guess what? Take a look at that and tell me it's not straight. And look at the edge I started with. It's crooked. That just shows you 
something that you can do with a strap cutter. You can straight edge a hide with a strap cutter if you're careful and know what you're doing. Now that's not a basic trick, that's an advanced trick. Once you've got your straight edge, if you want to lay your leather down on a table, use a straight edge and a knife, cut it, then nothing to it. Now here's the trick. You get it started. On this short piece of leather it wouldn't matter so much, but every piece, every strap that you cut, you need to hold this piece not this piece. If you hold this one, you're eventually going to pull off. And then you gotta re straight edge the dumb thing. Now there's a trick. Anytime you cut leather with a strap cutter, depending on the leather itself, you can hit hard spots in it. You know what starts to happen, Rusty, when you hit those hard spots? I would imagine that it's not happy with the strap cutter. It's not, and as you go along, pretty soon you end up with a piece of leather that's either got a curve in it or a little bump in it. Well, there's one way you can offset that. Turn your leather over so it's upside down, and we're just going to do this little trick again. We're going to hold that little piece, we're going to pull that down there, We've re-straight edged our leather. If you cut a, uh, if you're cutting a double shoulder and you notice your belts are starting to curve a little bit, most of the time it's not critical anyway because you can give them a little pull and straighten them out. <coughs> but turn the leather over, start cutting from the other end upside down, and those straps are going to start coming out just wonderful. You can cut just like nothing flat, and this is leather that we'll use for belt keepers. Something that you might be aware of too is is that especially on something long, uh, if you're doing a, a long piece or a side or even sometimes on double shoulders, if you can have somebody hold that so that you can move along, it really will increase the speed. It helps you kind of keep the whole thing together, especially as you get down towards the, the edge of the leather because yes. then it starts moving around and a lot. Not only do they hold it, they have to pull on it. Yep. They have to pull just a little bit and they have to pull in the direction of the strap cutter. In other words, they pull it that way, then it works. Yep. Now, if we want to go to a heavier piece of leather, we're going to open this up, open this end up until I get it just about right, and then we're going to cut, uh, well, let's see, just tighten that down. Now, when you, when you tighten this, this product is made from hard rock maple, and after years of use, this wood gets slick, and this little internal metal washer uh, might not hold it quite so well. So if you have to, take a little pair of pliers and just give it a tweak. No more than a tweak. That'll hold it. I'll tell you, yeah. they don't let me carry scissors, so I had to steal his. But this spot right here and a pair of scissors will give you a nice little tweak to it and then you can loosen it back up, but it does. I'll give those to you before I get cut. When somebody's holding the leather, man, you get perfect straps every time, and it just works. Now, depending on how tight you tighten this stupid thing, you might have to <laughs> use your scissors to loosen it, which works just fine. Now, you know something nice Maybe I shouldn't steal your thunder. Go ahead, do what you're doing. Well, I just wanted to show you a little trick. When you finally get down to your last blade and you don't have any more and you need one more strip, if you're careful, you can cut on the top of the strap cutter. It does require that you be careful. This seems advanced. This is advanced. I don't recommend doing this. But you know what? When you don't have a strap cutter blade and you are desperate, that's just okay. Something that <clears throat> it, it really is a little bit out of the realm, but this thing can be a money maker or it can actually cost you money when you're cutting belt strips out of something. If you've got a spot right there and you're cutting inch belts or inch and a half belts that's going to be right there but you know if you're making keepers for those belts 
If you'll come down and cut that spot right in half, or cut just to the inside of it, right out of the middle, you'll save yourself a lot of money, a lot of grief, and you'll be able to utilize the sides, the leather that you've got in a better manner, and it really will make you some money. Yeah, this is a distinct advantage of a, a handheld strap cutter over a mechanical strap cutter, simply because when you get to this place, you can cut right up to it, and then set your strap cutter to cut off a one-eighth inch strip cut it off and then go back to cutting your good stuff. And you've lost an eighth of an inch instead of an entire belt strip. Now, I don't have a piece of leather here to demonstrate, but to let you know, soft leather, you can cut deer skin with this. But just remember, the blade has to be sharp. We cut upholstery hides with this all the time. Again, the key, sharp blade, Keep the crossbars to where the leather will barely slide through so that somebody can hold that strip and you pull it and it'll cut perfect strips. But if that blade's dull, you might as well change it. Tip or tip, and this again is kind of out of the realm. If you're cutting something like deer skin, and he uses deer skin because of how stretchy it can be, especially in cutting a lace or a strap, if you take and put a little bit of tack, spray tack on the back of that, and put it down to a piece of paper, like a construction paper, or even a piece of Bontex, a bag stiffener, a manila fold or something, and cut it, you can peel that back off of there, and man, it'll make straight edges on that if you really need to cut some. Yeah, that's a good point. Contact paper works pretty good, too. Yep. Anything to stiffen up your leather. But with most things, uh, deer skin is probably the most difficult thing you'll ever cut with a strap cutter, and I don't recommend it. Uh, but upholstery, other soft leather suede, they work just fine. Is there anything I'm missing? Don't cut yourself. Thanks. Hi, I'm Kevin with Springfield Leather. This is a video on how to sharpen a swivel knife. We're shooting it during store hours. You will hear the happy little telephone ringing and you will hear people talking. That's because we're working and hopefully somebody will answer that before very long. The twelfth most lousy thing in the world is trying to cut leather with a dull swivel knife. Now, you may know how to sharpen a swivel knife and do a pretty good job, but there's a lot of people that don't. And even for the ones that do know how to sharpen a swivel knife, you may find part of this interesting. So I'm going to show you. I got my happy little piece of leather wet. This is brand new swivel knife right out of the back. <laughs> now you probably are very familiar with that scenario. It jerks and it drags and it pulls. Well, for many, for most, sharpening a swivel knife is simply a matter of taking a little bit of jeweler's rouge and creating your own little strop. This is just like uh, Basically, this is what Grandpa used to use to sharpen the old single-edge razor, or a barber would use to, to sharpen his razor. And all we're going to do is take this knife blade and drag it back, not doing this. Do not do this. If you raise the butt end of that knife up, you'll round off the edge. You don't want to do that. So just pull it straight, wipe the gunk off it, and you'll see a big improvement. Now, for what it's worth, if somebody in the family has a dull kitchen knife, doesn't cut the tomatoes too hot, any kind of a knife blade, you will immediately notice an incredible difference in the cutting ability. Now, that buffing compound that I rubbed on here was white. You see how it's already turning it black? That's because it's removing metal. Most of the time, if your swivel knife has the proper edge on it, all it takes is just stropping it and it'll be sharp enough to work very well. Now, unfortunately, we drop these dumb things. In view of that, I'm going to take the blade out. Eventually.
maybe as soon as I get the right size screwdriver. Okay, I've got my swivel knife blade out of the knife. Set that down. You may or may not have seen one of these. There's uh, two pieces to it. It's called a keen edge sharpener. Quite the complicated little device. You stick your swivel knife blade in there and hold it in with your finger. Tighten this thing down. And we're going to take a whetstone. Put a little oil on it. Sewing machine oil. Then what you do is pick up your swivel knife blade, lay this on your stone, get down and look at it until you get the angle right, adjust this little bar so that everything is fine, then all you do is push until you get it, until you get the nick or whatever it is in that blade out has to be gone back and forth back and forth now that will make it so that your knife blade has the proper edge but it also creates a problem and this is something that a lot of people don't realize when these blades are manufactured they're held in some kind of a jig and they're usually pushed down onto a flat spinning wheel and it's ground to the proper angle. But the grind marks that that tool leaves are vertical. Think about it. You're pulling this leather, this blade, through the leather horizontally. Automatic drag. The way that you can really sharpen your swivel knife well is to take this little blade, get your oil on your your stone. Just hold it to the proper angle and you can feel it right away. And just go back and forth sideways, both sides, until you get those little grind marks running sideways, not up and down. Now once you've done that, then we can get rid of some of this junk before I drop it again. We're going to put knife blade back in the swivel knife. Then we're going to very carefully wipe off the excess oil. Is my wife around here? We're going to wipe this off on a rag. Why are you and that way picking uh, no we don't get in any trouble. Gun. Okay. Now. If you have sharpened it on that stone, and if you think you're going to cut leather with it, you are sadly mistaken. It does not work that way. You have to go back, pull that knife on this strop. Now, it's nice if you can do this, but it's a little more difficult on a piece of leather. You can, you just got to be careful. Now, what? In effect, what that does, it, it takes your, your blade that's got the proper angle on it and it polishes it. Once it's polished, it works. Now we'll see if I've been successful. Hopefully, this is how a swivel knife should work. You know what? I think I did it. Now you know. The little cut on the top, that's the jerky one. Those cuts down there, they're nice and smooth. Make sure your blade is polished. Got the right edge on it, it works. But it's got to be polished. Thanks. Bye. 
Hi, I'm Kevin with Springfield Leather. Somehow, somewhere, somebody said they wanted to know how to set a snap and a rivet. So we're going to set a snap and a rivet. There's not too much to it, but there's a couple of things that it would be pretty good for you to know. There's a few things you have to have. First of all, you need a mallet, preferably not a steel hammer. Second of all, you need a good hard surface to pound on, like this block of marble that I've got here. Granite will work, steel will work, anything like that is fine for setting a snap. When you set a snap, you got to make a hole first if you're putting it in leather. So you need a hole punch of some kind. Really doesn't matter what kind, but, but I've got this one. Then you need a punching surface so that you can make your hole in your leather without damaging your punch. This is a little hard piece of rubber. A little white poly cutting board like you use in your kitchen will work just fine. And then you need snaps and or rivets. And one of the key factors is you need the proper setting tools. If you don't have that, this is difficult. Okay. We're going to pretend that we're making a, a leather bracelet and we're going to set some snaps in it. I'm going to take my happy little bracelet and my happy little punch and I'm going to hold that punch pretty firmly smack it and I've made two holes. I'm going to turn it around make two more Okay, we've got our holes done. Now, we need snaps. And I have those right here. Most snaps consist of four parts. I don't know how well you can see them, but we can uh, probably get a close-up of them here for you pretty soon to look at. There's a cap and a socket and there's a post and a stud. Those are the parts that go together. More than likely you have some article of clothing or something in your house that has snaps like this already on it so you can see how they go together. But for now we're just going to go from there. Okay, snap setter. The snap I'm setting is a baby dot snap or a line 20 snap. I'm going to take the cap, put it in my bracelet, and I'm going to set this cap in this little concave anvil and I'm going to put the socket right over the top of it. I'm going to take my setter and here's, here's one of the tricky parts of setting the snap. You have to kind of hold this all down together with your thumb and your finger and hold the tool at the same time because if you don't, watch what happens. You see, everything just kind of raises up and it, it's not happy, it's all loose. So we're going to set the tool right inside that post, hold the, the snap pieces down firmly against the leather, make sure you hold the setter straight up and down, that's important. If you don't, it's not going to be very happy. Then you hit it. Hit it a couple times, kind of sharp. Take a look at it, maybe once more. Let's see what we got. Okay, that looks pretty good. It's really hard to see very much, but then we're going to take the other piece and we're going to take the, the post and stick it through the leather from the inside and we, we want to make sure that the snap's going to work correctly. I want this to come around and snap like this. That makes sense if it's a wristband. So, because if we would do it like this, then it wouldn't come around and snap. Your snap pieces would be incorrect, positioned wrongly. I've got the little post pushed through the leather. I'm going to set this stud right on top of it. And again, just position the setter right inside, hold everything down with my thumb and finger smack smack that's pretty good and now comes the tricky part we're gonna see if it works 
It works. One down. Happy snap. We do the same thing on the other side and our snaps are good to go. Now, there's something else that you need to know. Your wristband or whatever material that you're setting your snaps in, uh, it, it's important that the thickness be correct in accordance with the snap that you're using. Now, I'm going through the same steps, holding everything down with my fingers. If you use leather that is too thin, this might not be happy. If you try to set your snap on a board rather than something really hard, it's probably not going to work. There's just too much bounce. It, it's not happy. You need to have something really hard and solid like a piece of steel, piece of granite or marble. Happy days. Snaps. Now, I told you that your leather needs to be the right thickness. If it's not, what's going to happen, and you'll know it right away, is you'll have too much metal post sticking out of one of these snap parts. So when you go to set it, there's no place for all that metal to go. Well, you either need to use thicker leather or a thinner, shorter snap or whatever the case, but you have to make sure that you've got the right snap for the right leather. Wherever you buy your snaps, they should be able to help you with that. There is a trick that you can use to offset that a little bit, especially with the cap and the socket. If you discover that your post is too long on that cap and you set it and it kind of bends over a little bit, that might not really matter. The key issue is that inside this snap, there can't be too much of a metal buildup or this stud just won't fit inside of that socket. If there's too much snap in there, too much metal rather, you can take a flat piece of steel, set it down inside there, and you can bonk, 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 and that'll flatten that out in there and you can still make it work. Okay, that's a snap. Now there's lots of different kinds of snaps. The only thing you have to know is that the right parts have got to go together, just like I showed you. You've got to have the right setter. There is no one tool sets all for snaps. Now, rivets. Let's see. We will take... Rivets are easy, by the way. You'll, uh, you'll like this. We're going to take a medium rivet, if I can find one. And we're just going to make a hole on the end of our leather. A rivet is obviously a means of putting two pieces of leather together permanently. It's not going to come apart. So, I want to take my rivet, I'm going to set it upright, right there on the rock, put my leather over it, and set the cap right on top and kind of push it down. It sort of holds itself in place. You don't need an anvil, as a rule, to set a rivet. But, you do need something hard. Do not try to set a rivet on this little rubber board. It does not work. Don't try to set a rivet on a table or a piece of wood. It does not work. You need to have something really hard. Granite is best. A rivet setter is about the simplest thing under the sun. All it is is a little piece of steel that's dished out on the end. You place it right on top of the, the rivet cap hold it straight up and down. That's pretty important. Smack. 
There you go. Rivet. Really easy. Now, if you want to do it even easier, you get another rivet. If you're not too fussy about the way that uh, the rivet cap looks, you can take your rivet, put your leather over it, and if you're careful, you can hit it. That's why they call these things, some people call them rapid rivets or speedy rivets, because all you've got to do is have a super hard surface, put the cap on there and smack. It's nice if you have the little dished out rivet setter because that keeps the cap looking nice. If you don't have that, hey, use something flat. It'll set it. You just won't have as nice a looking, your cap won't look as nice. Let's see. One other thing. If you're setting a rivet, the length of the post and the thickness of the leather is critical. We will take, uh, let's see if I can find a long one here. There's a long rivet. This is a very thin piece of leather. It's extreme. This is an extreme example so that you can see and understand what happens. We're going to put the two pieces together. That is retarded. It doesn't work like that. If you try to set this rivet, the only thing that's going to happen, well, it's come apart, it's slanted, it doesn't, it, it just didn't work at all. And now it's a mess and it's going to be hard to get apart and it's not happy. So make sure. Your leather's the right thickness according to the rivet. Now, when you stick your rivet through the leather, you, you can have about an eighth of an inch sticking up, give or take a little. It's almost better for the rivet to be a little bit too short than for it to be too long. You'll, you'll know soon enough. Anyway, happy snapping and happy riveting. This is called a pro pedal. It's probably a little difficult to see, but uh, it's an Osborne tool, has a flat edge, and it is fairly sharp. And this tool is no different than other cutting tools in the sense that it needs to be sharpened. You can use your same little strop. You have to be careful. You just want to pull it one direction, and again, wipe any residue off that might be on there. Now you're ready to go. Okay, now we're going to actually start lifting up the pedals. Now, I'm going to take the pointy end of this tool and I'm going to put it right down in the part of the leaf where the cut goes in. And I'm going to start pushing and just wiggling a little bit and I'm going to move it back and forth. And I'm actually cutting. Not a lot, but I'm cutting. Now keep in mind, the leather's wet. That helps. Another thing that's helpful is the fact that this is a piece of Herman Oak leather. Nothing molds and stretches and works like Herman Oak. Now as we go around here and lift these pedals, you notice how I use this, my, my other fingers here, my other hand, to provide a base for what I'm doing. Work the tool back and forth, cutting and pushing down in as you go. Now, the tool has a flat edge like we showed you earlier. That helps you to not go too deep. So you get it started, and you work it in, going back and forth, and actually, you can push this tool under the leather a long, long ways. You can really get carried away if you want to. Now, not everybody does, of course. But you can experiment with this tool and you'll be amazed 
at what you can do. There's other kinds of tools that will do the same thing, but mostly on a smaller scale. There's some stamping tools that are called undercut bevelers. And I believe B892, B60, B61 are those tools. But they're more for use on smaller areas, perhaps a belt, something of that nature. You may have to stop every now and then. Sharpen your pro pedal or polish it up. And remember, you can slide it under, cutting through the leather just about as far as you want to go. Then you can come back and you can actually lift up really lift those those pedals up. Just make sure the leather is wet enough to, to hold its shape. Now you can probably see the amount of lift that you can attain. And with oak leaves this is just a wonderful tool. You can make oak leaves really look good. You probably notice there's some uh, marks here on the leather where we entered the pedals. You can remove those to some degree with a modeling tool. You can re-bevel with a larger beveling tool. This small one probably won't do so great, but it does okay. see it helps quite a bit. A matting tool is actually better. That works really good. As a matter of fact, as long as we're doing this, maybe I'll just take the time to grab one of those tools. And show you what a matting tool does. This is a very common matting tool. It's a lot like a beveler. Again, moisture content really helps a lot. And you can start to see what a tremendous difference using a matting tool can make. Now we've done half of it with this one. We're going to do half with another one, just so you can see the effect. This is a P005, I believe. tool you can walk. Now if you remember all those little marks that the pro pedal left, they're all gone. Matting tool, this one really leaves a, a wonderful texture. You can extend that texture out away from your design. You just don't have to hit it as hard the farther you get away from the design. So, there's a couple tips. Hope you like them. Hi, Kevin with Springfield Leather. 
We're going to do a short uh, video on basket weave stamping, stamping with the basket tools. Uh, this is basically for someone that has never used a basket weave tool or perhaps has a few problems with it or maybe someone that just wants to try it but doesn't quite know how to get going. First thing we're going to do is get our leather wet. And if you're going to do this, by the way, you really should use pretty decent leather. Anytime you're stamping or tooling on leather, the leather itself that you're using just makes a big difference. We're going to let that soak in for a moment. The first example we're going to do, uh, we're going to pretend that we're doing a belt. And I've got a little tool called a wing divider. Now if you want, open it up to whatever distance you want. We're going to scribe a very light line down both edges. And we're going to scribe a line down the middle. How do you find the middle, you ask? You hunt for it, I said. Now you can measure, you can get your little ruler out and do all that stuff and that's fine. I've done this before so I'm not going to do that. But you can see we've got our little border lines and a center line. Next, I'm going to take a basket weave tool. This is an X513 in case you're wondering. And I'm going to stamp it right on one side of that line. Then I'm going to turn my leather around. Now here's the, here's the key part. When you're using this basket weave tool, a lot of people will just put one end of the stamp up against the other end, but that's not the way it works. What you do is you stick the foot of that tool right inside the other impression so it actually overlaps. Now, you have to turn the leather around quite a bit on this first, uh, first pass. Make sure you keep that tool all the way inside the last impression. Make sure you keep it lined up straight with the line that you drew down the middle. Boy, it's always nice working with uh, Herman Oak leather. Man, it just makes a wonderful impression. Now you can see how the end of that tool fit right inside the last impression. Now, if you make a mistake and you get a little bit off, don't worry about it. You can kind of fix that as you go along. You just need to fix it as soon as you notice. Now, next, both of those feet right inside the last ones. And now you don't have to uh, turn your leather. Now we're going to turn it around and go down the other side. Same way. Keep that tool so it goes right inside the last impressions. Now, let's do this one too. As we go along here, you'll notice I just started with a line that was approximately in the middle. It wasn't perfect. It doesn't have to be. We're, we're getting up close now to the edge of our belt. So what do we do? Well, we're going to stamp this time. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to lean this tool back towards me a little bit. Just a little. It won't leave quite as deep of an impression right up near the border. I'm going to show you several options here. Okay, that's what we have so far. Now, if you want to, you can take your swivel knife, which I'm going to do, and sharpen mine, and I'm going to go ahead and cut this border both of them. Then 
I'm going to take a beveling tool, if I can find one, and I'm going to bevel it. right down the edge. I'm not worried about being uh, overly perfect on this because of a certain step that we're going to take. So we'll get it beveled all the way down. There. And then we're going to just repeat the same thing that we did a minute ago. We're going to take Stamp both sides of the center line. And I'll tell you, getting in a hurry when you're basket stamping is not a happy deal. It just doesn't work out so great especially when you use the small basket weave stamps. My goodness, you have got to be a serious glutton for punishment when you're using those small basket weave tools. Some folks love them. I gotta say, they look really good. And boy are they a pain and well they're a pain. Okay, you see what we have this one we've gone all the way across. I'm going to take a border stamp. This is just a little camouflage tool and right on that line I'm going to tip the tool towards me and I'm going to stamp that border in there right over the top of some of those stamped basket weave impressions. and I'm going to keep going. Turn it around, we're going to do the other side. When you use a camouflage tool like this, and you're going to do a basket weave border, it's kind of a handy little tip if you'll, if you'll put the toe of the tool inside the toe impression that you just made. In other words, don't stamp the tool so that it's right next to one another. Stamp it so that it's right inside, barely inside the last place that you stamped. We're just going to go right across here for a little bit. Okay, now this is the part we're concerned with. Look at that. Even though we stamped over some of the, the impressions, it looks like it was made that way. Looks like that was the way it was intended to be, and it looks good. If you're a perfectionist, you can measure a little more closely than I did, and you won't have that issue. I'm not a perfectionist, if you don't know that by now. Now, this one here, you'll notice, this tool doesn't come quite far enough up to cover there's a little space in there, and I just, I just don't like that. So I'm going to take a different basket weave tool, or I'm sorry, a different camouflage tool, and I'm going to do the same thing. We're just going to, in the same fashion, go right across the border, and this is going to give it that finished look, I hope. There we are. Better. There's a lot of different ways you can use a basket weave tool. A lot of different ways. So don't hesitate to experiment. You can slant this thing. Uh, you can make V's out of the tool design. You can just do a lot. This is just a simple way 
for you to start. Okay, now one more thing. We're going to take another piece of leather. This time we'll take a little bigger one. Going to get it wet. And we're going to let it sit there just a minute. This time we're going to take our wing divider and I'm going to open it up here oh, about like such. Make a happy little line down there. Make another happy little line there. If you want to, you can cut that line, you can bevel it, you can do whatever you want. But the main purpose of this tool is to show you what an X507 will do. This is a true basket stamp. This makes the dumb thing look like somebody wove a basket. We're going to put it right in the corner and we're going to turn it just like that. Then we're going to turn it back you probably get the idea. Really makes a nice little woven pattern. Now, we're just going to go right down one side. You have to turn it every time and follow that line. With this tool, you just have to be reasonably careful. The biggest thing with this tool is the fact that it's okay to overlap the stamps just a little, but it's not okay to have a space between them. So we'll just go straight across and we'll maybe make one more pass so that you can really see the full effect. And as you go, it's helpful if you try to concentrate on keeping the tool itself straight. And by this I mean don't do don't do this. I don't know if you can see how much I turned it, but that's not good. Keep it straight in relationship to the other stamped impressions and you'll do just fine. What a lovely basket stamp. There you go. You could cut that out and wrap it around a, a soda can holder or something and tell people you wove it. Happy basket weaving. I'm Kevin with Springfield Leather. You know, one of the most difficult things that people have trouble with when they're trying to do Western floral carving is decorative cuts. And decorative cuts, they're just the hardest part of it. So I thought I'd take a few minutes today and show you just a couple of tricks that will really help you a lot if you're having a little trouble with your decorative cuts. Okay, first of all, leather, water, Believe it or not, when you're making decorative cuts, usually at that time you've got your pattern pretty well tooled, but you still have to have the right amount of water in the leather for your knife to be able to work happily. Now, I got a nice piece of Herman Oak leather here and I'm getting it pretty darn wet. And if I'm going to be doing Western floral style carving on leather, I really want it to be Herman Oak. I'm a little bit prejudiced, but I've been carving leather for a lot of years and I know the difference between a good carving leather and a carving leather that's not so good, so that's why I like to use this. Now as you can see, uh, after the leather was wet, and it was wet pretty good, it's starting to return to its natural color. That's what I want. It's, it's ready to make those cuts. So if you can, in your project, while you're working on your project, you need to make sure that your leather still has the right amount of water in it. And that does take some ex experimentation, but you'll, you'll quickly see what the right amount of moisture is. First thing I'm going to do is take a little scrap piece of leather, rub some jeweler's rouge into it, 
and I'm going to make my, my swivel knife blade nice and polished. That's essential. You cannot do good decorative cuts or even any cutting with a swivel knife unless your knife blade is polished. It's not critical that it be razor sharp. I mean, it's knife, nice if it's sharp, but it needs to be polished. So strop it, and you can see it turns the, the jeweler's rouge on this piece of leather black. That's because it's removing metal. Okay, now, decorative cuts. This is how it's supposed to work. Now, that's really simple. One of the big tricks with decorative cuts is to keep them simple. As your skill improves, you can go ahead and complicate your cuts a little bit. And it doesn't take very long to really get pretty good with this little swivel knife. But there's a couple of things that you absolutely have to remember. First of all, it is mandatory, like I said, that that swivel knife be sharp. Now, in case you haven't figured it out yet, I'll tell you again. Your swivel knife has to be sharp. You probably get the idea. Sharpness is not an option here. It's got to be polished. Polished. Polished so that it's slick and slides through the leather. Okay, moisture content. You'll get the hang of that. Now, the trick about these decorative cuts is this. I'm going to make a couple of lines here with the swivel knife that are not related to these cuts, but you'll see what I'm talking about. Do you notice how all the cuts come down towards the point of that upside down triangle? That's what decorative cuts have to do. Now if you have a, a western floral pattern, then you have to decide where you want those cuts to come down to. As a, for instance, we'll take a little, just, just a little bit of a freehand pattern here. This is not, again, not complicated. That's just a simple little leaf and a scroll. What we want are decorative cuts that flow with that pattern. I'll show you a right way and a wrong way. Now, as we go about this, when you start a decorative cut, normally, you want your knife blade to be crosswise in front of you. Maybe not quite perfectly crosswise, but kind of sort of crossways in front of you, not facing you uh, vertically. You want it horizontally in front of you. The reason for that is when you make a decorative cut, you need to turn the swivel knife blade almost immediately. That's what gives us the cuts like we made over here. That blade was turned immediately. So we're going to put some little cuts in here and just watch. I'm starting that blade. You can see I push down, turn it, pull it towards me, and ease off the pressure. I'm gonna, this one, I'm going to have just, this one's going to not be so horizontal. It's going to face me a little bit, and I'm going to turn it, follow the swivel cut, There's the two cuts that I just did. Now, notice the ends of the cut. They all point in the same direction. They point down to here. That's really important when you're making decorative cuts. They all need to point towards the same place. I'm going to make a few more. You'll start to see how this works. 
decorative cuts don't have to be long and fancy. Starting with it crosswise in front of me, turning it around, digging it in, picking up the pressure, easing off several times. Now, look at the cuts in those leaves. They all have one thing in common. They come down to that point in your pattern. Whatever pattern that you're making, that's what you need to do. Ensure that those cuts come down to that focal point. And once you, and, and by the way, I gotta tell you, this is tons easier on a good piece of leather than it is on a piece of leather that's not so good. I don't want this to sound like a big sales pitch, and, and maybe it does, but if you have never carved on leather, such as Herman Oak or perhaps Wicked and Craig, you really can't appreciate the difference in the way your swivel knife works. Now I'm gonna get, I'm gonna go a little further, just see what happens. By the way, there's no rules when it comes to making decorative cuts other than the fact that they should flow and they should all come down to that point like we talked about. We're just making some very, very small cuts. Now some people would perhaps use an angle blade to make decorative cuts. I don't do that. I use a flat one. The reason I use a, a flat blade is because I'm lazy. It has, count them, one, two corners. So when one corner gets dull, you turn it around, and you use the other one. Now you're still going to have to sharpen this thing every few minutes. So don't hesitate. And by the way, this is one of the things that will enable you to tell the difference between a really good piece of leather and a piece of leather that's not so good. If you've got your knife sharp and your knife kind of does this number, then you know that leather is just not the best leather that it could be. So good piece of leather helps incredibly. And if you make a mistake, you can probably fix it. That's a good thing. Now look at all the happy little cuts. They're just little. They're small. They're simple. That's what you want to keep in mind when you're making decorative cuts. Keep them small, simple, and above all, ease off the pressure when the cut comes to an end. Gradually ease it off. Don't just stop. Here's what it looks like when you make a cut and all of a sudden you just stop. Look at this. What a difference between that and this. Look how nice that is. This one flows, this one just stops dead. I'm going to show you what happens when you don't keep those cuts coming down to a focal point. We're going to take that nice looking cut. You see, that's what happens right there to a lot of folks. They're making those swivel cuts and they forget to bring them all down to a point. And this is true on any floral carving pattern that you do. Now, if you're working on an oak leaf, all those cuts go towards the center of the leaf. Any kind of a leaf.
cuts go towards the center of the leaf. Now there's times, like I said, when you make a mistake and you could probably fix things like this, but you have to fix them in such a way Believe me, sometimes it's a little easier to... do them right in the first place. And it is to fix something. Now, I don't know how much fixing that is. You can decide. But it's at least better. There's a a ton of exercises that you can do with a swivel knife to teach yourself to make decorative cuts. You can read books. You can get good leather. You can keep your knife sharp. But the biggest thing is to keep those cuts coming down in a focal point. You Once you have a western floral pattern on your leather, you can do so many things just by keeping that knife sharp. Short cuts. Make your cuts simple. You can add to your design for days and days and days. little accents make big differences. So there you go. Keep your swivel knife sharp. Keep it polished regularly. Jewelers Rouge costs a couple bucks. You can get enough for that much money to last your lifetime probably. Now if you drop the dumb knife then you're gonna have to take that nick out and so you'll need a stone or whatever but you can repolish it. When you make a decorative cut Start with firm pressure and then ease up as you slowly pull it out of the leather as you glide it right back towards yourself. Keep the cuts coming down to a focal point. And that applies to inside of flowers, leaves, and everything. Practice with some border cuts. You can Decorative cuts don't have to be restricted to the inside of a pattern. Look at the outside. You can do all kinds of neat stuff. So there's a couple tips and hints. Thanks. Hi, Kevin with Springfield Leather. In this video, I'm going to show you how to do two different things. We're going to make a, a handbag front for a, a child's handbag. I'm going to show you how to do a really easy, quick pattern that just about anybody can do, and it's your own pattern. Then we're going to show you how to, to stain it in sort of a retro fashion, and we're going to use just a couple of different products and it'll be really easy and you'll be surprised at the look that we get. So first thing we're going to do, of course, get our leather good and wet. And after we get it wet, we're going to let it sit for a minute to absorb all that water. And then we're going to do two things. We're going to sharpen our swivel knife doesn't take a lot to sharpen it because I kind of keep it polished all the time. Wipe the gunk off. Then we're going to make a pattern. Now you might think that that's difficult, but it's not. I'm going to turn it over so that the damp side is down. And I'm going to take a little piece of tracing film and just lay it there. And all I'm going to do is draw an S. Doesn't even matter if it's a very good S. I don't know how well we can see that, but there's a little S. Now once I've got my S on there, I'm going to add a couple of little bitty lines, just little ones. So this thing is kind of going to be a little bit like a flower vine, if you will. Here's what we have so far. 
not too complicated, is it? Good, because that was the tough part right there. So feel free to do it over if you don't like your S. Now, I'm going to turn it over, and I'm going to use a little tracing tool, and I'm just going to trace over my S and all my little vine marks there onto the wet leather. You know, I don't even care if I follow the lines very closely or not. It just really doesn't matter. And again, as always, we're shooting this video just in store hours so that you may see people wandering around or or hear the phone ring or whatever the case. Now, happy days. Not too difficult. All I'm going to do for the other side is take a, a blank piece of tracing film and lay it down and I'm just going to turn this piece of tracing film upside down so that whatever pencil marking or ink pen that I just used won't leave any marks on the leather and I'm just going to trace over it again. Again, don't worry about following the lines perfectly because it's not necessary. And after you do about one of these, you might just find out you can do this freehand with no difficulty at all. Now if you were lucky enough or unlucky enough to have been around in the 60s and 70s, you've seen a lot of this type of thing. So that's what our pattern looks like. Next thing we do, we're going to cut it with a swivel knife. So here we go. Swivel knife, since it's already sharpened, it's just going to slide through this piece of Herman Oak leather really well. And we kind of ease up as we come close to the, the S that we've uh, traced onto the leather. Push down hard to start with. If you, if you miss your lines a little bit, don't worry. Not the end of the world. Or even close. You want to make your lines curve a little bit more, feel free to do it because now is the time. Now our pattern's a little more visible. Kind of okay, huh? Now comes the fun part. All we're going to do is use some simple stamping tools. I have several here, and we're just going to pick these five to start with. And you'll probably recognize this when I put the designs into the leather. Before I do that, I have to get a hammer. Okay, we've got our hammer. I'm going to take this little uh, cluster of leaves, and I'm going to stamp it on oh that one. This one, that one, this one. There. Simple, isn't it? I'm sure you're getting the idea. Now I'm going to take a little flower and I'm going to stamp it on that one, this one. Oh, let's do that one too. Oh, heck with it. We'll do them all. Nothing like flowers and leaves. Next, we're going to take a leaf, actually a couple of them, and on that S that we did, we're just going to randomly stamp uh, a few of these leaves really doesn't matter where. You can just kind of pick. Okay, big leaves. Just takes you right back to 1972, doesn't it? Well, maybe not. 
you're like me, you might not remember 1972. Then we're going to take a little leaf. Same thing. Just a few. Wherever you think they might be nice. Okay, once we've got all of our happy little leaves stamped in there, see, I think I see another place I'd like one. Now, not much to it. Very simple and very nice and very easy to do. It only takes you a minute or two. You can create your own pattern. Uh, experiment a little bit and you'll have a good time with it. Now, once you got your pattern in there, we want to stain it. There are 400 million ways that you can stain a piece of leather. The way that I'm going to show you uh, is just a simple way, and all you've got to have is a damp sponge. So I'm going to get one of those. All right, back with my water jar. This is a genuine 100% Folgers Colombian grown water jar. Now before I dye this, I want to let you know this isn't entirely dry. There's some things that you can hurry right along and it really doesn't matter. And there's some things that you can't. You just have to learn those things as you go. So you're getting a little bit of a, a tip and a hint sort of as we go along. First thing you got to have is a damp sponge. I've got one here. And it's a really expensive one. comes from Dollar General. Actually, I cut it in two, so it's a 50 cent general, but it works. I poured a little bit of a product called X1 into this container, and I put, oh, probably a half a dozen drops of Phoebing's dark brown dye in here. You don't have to do that. You can use the X1 straight, and it works just fine. But I wanted to give it a little brownish tint to what we're doing. So what I'm going to do is stick the corner of my sponge in here and get some some liquid on it. Now, just so that everyone knows, my wife, as well as a great many of the people in here in this store, have told me that sometimes I'm not too bright. I'm going to verify that. I'm not using plastic gloves. If you want to use plastic gloves, more power to you. I'm not going to do it. Once I get that stuff on my sponge, I'm going to just wipe it into this piece of leather, and I'm going to get quite a bit of it right down into all those swivel cuts and stamped areas that we made and I don't know how well you can see it from the camera's point of view but as you work it and you can tell I'm just rubbing it and working it and working it it evens out wonderfully the only really real thing that you have to be conscious of using this stuff is just make sure that you get it down into the stamped areas and the cuts. That's kind of important. You need to do that. But you can do that. It's not hard. Now, this stuff, by the way, kind of wipes off your hands, which is nice. Now, I've got some on my hands here from an earlier project. I made some little bags uh, for my grandkids the other day. And I, that's what inspired me to do this, thinking some people might like to watch. So I'm going to set this down on an old piece of tracing film. And next, I'm going to use a dry sponge. Now this time we're going to use a, a regular Phoebing's alcohol-based dye. If you've never used this stuff, it can be a little bit scary. If you get this on you, it will stay on you for a while. I am living proof. It goes away after a day or so. Typically, you don't use very much of it, and if you don't know what you're doing, it can really be a challenge to use. But here's a pretty easy way. I'm going to take a sponge. It's, that, it's the other half of my Dollar General sponge. It's very dry, and that's the way I want it. It'll work if it's wet, but I'd rather have a, a dry one. I've got a large bottle, a large bottle of that dark brown dye, 
um, rather than open a new small one, I'm going to use this. I'm going to hold my sponge up there really tight. And I just soaked a little bit of that dye onto this sponge. Not enough to go through, but just a little bit. And we're going to put the lid back on. Nextly, I'm going to take this little piece of cardboard and I'm going to get a whole bunch of that dye off. I don't want it on there. I've wiped all the excess dye off. There's still quite a bit of dye on this sponge. It'll stain you right now, but I got a bunch of that immediate excess off of the sponge. Now I'm going to move my marble to where it's at the edge of the table. And I'm going to go right over the top of that finish that I just put on here. And since I've got the marble near the edge of the table, it kind of lets me just do the edge of this project how I want to. I'm going to put a sort of a dark edge on it. And you can you'll immediately see what you can do with this as you begin to play with it. Now I've got the edges done. Okay. Now the next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to dye the center of this. But when you do that, you want to make sure you have very little dye on your sponge. So this time, you see how much more comes off? It just keeps coming off. I'm going to get the vast majority of that dye off of here. That way I can put it on the leather with confidence. And I'm going to start at the edges and I'm just going to start wiping and rubbing inwards towards the center. And I'm going to go all the way around. Now again, just letting you know, we went right over the top of that other product before it had even dried. This is one of those instances where you can do that. We call that particular product X1 or another X1 or another name for it that we have here is Goof Proof. It works really well and it's called Goof Proof for obvious reasons. That's pretty nice. All I'm going to do as a final step is spray it with a leather finish and I'm done. And that'll make a little handbag front that some little kid will just be tickled with. Now, now we just need to see if it has the SLC seal of approval. Maybe you could bring our our inspector over here. This is Bubby. He is one of many of the Springfield leather mascots here. He is the snippiest, snarliest little chihuahua you've ever seen in your life and he tries to bite everything even if he likes it. If Bubby doesn't say anything, it's good. What do you think, Bubby? Passes. I thought I'd take a minute and also show you an alternative way to really spice up this sort of design if you wish. Just kind of to step it up a little bit, like Emerald says or whatever he does. Uh, this is the same pattern that we have on our finished piece. The thing that we're going to do differently is make some additions with our swivel knife. You, it's pretty, pretty amazing what a few decorative cuts will do. So just kind of watch. Again, make sure your swivel knife is sharp and concentrate on making just short, little bitty cuts. Don't have to be very long at all. We're just going to make some sort of uh, where the little flower stems come and attach. Every few places you'll just see some. Usually when you make a decorative cut, you want to uh, make some little accent cuts if you can. Now here's what we've got so far, but we're going to keep on going a little bit. You can see that really helps. It doesn't take a lot to do that. 
every time you make nice decorative cuts, you actually create a place where you can make more decorative cuts. And you can really give some flow to your design. And depending on how much room you have, you can really make some nice use of your leather and your space that you've got to work with. And you'll kind of see here as we go along. And these type of cuts are so simple that once you understand how to make them look like they flow with the leather, really it's kind of nice. Now see? It keeps getting just a little bit, uh, I don't know, maybe more enjoyable is the word. We'll do one more, one more pass here. This time we're going to add a squiggle. We're going to take, make a little straight line with a circle under it. And gosh, you could just go on and on and on and, and and never stop. People will think you're a genius once you get to do this, by the way. See our happy little squiggle up there? And that's good. When you use that uh, X1 stain and it gets down into all those cuts, boy, that really makes your work look nice. Thought you might like to see that. Thanks.